Ancient Egypt was one of humanity's oldest civilizations, and at its height it stretched along the fertile Nile River, ruling as far north as Syria and as far south as Sudan. Their culture lasted for over 3,000 years, developed three unique writing systems, though hieroglyphics is the one most people have heard of, and created some of the most recognizable art and architecture of the ancient world. Thanks to the reliable seasonal floods from the Nile and relatively simple basin irrigation, their civilization always had an abundance of food. As a result, the monarchs of Egypt, aka the pharaohs, and the priests that served under them could dedicate time, resources, and manpower towards building wonders of the world like the pyramids of Giza. But like many civilizations, it did not last. Egypt was conquered many times by foreign invaders before ultimately becoming a province of the Roman Empire in 30 BC, finally ending the reign of the pharaohs. Still, considering how long Egypt lasted, it's not hard to imagine them holding out even longer. Could the reign of the pharaohs continue, perhaps even to the present day? Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrovich, the alternate historian. In this video, we are going back thousands of years in the past to change history in order to save ancient Egypt. Before we continue, I must confess, I'm not an expert on ancient Egypt. Thankfully, my buddy Lucas of the YouTube channel Armchair Egyptology was graciously willing to educate us all about one pharaoh I found particularly interesting for this video, Necho II. Take it away, Lucas. Anytime, Matt. Now, Necho II inherited a complicated job from his father, Psamtik I. Psamtik, founder of the 26th dynasty, unified the two kingdoms after it had been divided by conflicting dynasties in what we call the Third Intermediate Period. But he didn't do it alone. His father, generously called Necho I, we'll get to that in a second, was a king of the Delta region, holding the city of Sais. And he was sufficiently influential that he gained the allegiance of the Neo-Assyrian Empire under King Esarhaddon, who, driven by prophecy, invaded Egypt as part of a campaign of global conquest. This worked out fine for Necho because he himself was in rebellion against the pharaoh Taharqa, who ruled Egypt as a province of the Kushite Empire whose heartland was in modern-day Sudan. Necho I, though, wasn't really the first of anything. He was never king of a unified Egypt, and died before the struggle against the Kushite pharaohs was even completed. When it was done, his son Pasamtik was installed as one of several Egyptian rulers by the Assyrians, but with help from the Kingdom of Lydia in the western part of modern-day Turkey, as well as mercenaries from Greece and Arabia, he was able to remove all of the rival mini-kings. This wasn't really a resistance to the Assyrians, but they hardly approved of their Egyptian arrangements being disrupted. Now, they were having their own problems, and by the time Necho II came to power in 610 BCE, they weren't in a position to establish their imperial dominance over Egypt because the Babylonians had resurged and were pushing back against Assyrian rule. There are a lot of kingdoms and peoples involved in this story, and you don't care what all their names are, but the upshot of it all is. When Necho came to power, though he did try to maintain an alliance with the Assyrians, they weren't destined to benefit. Necho invaded Syria, a campaign so famous that's why we call him Necho, because Necho is what he's called in the Bible when it talks about this invasion. But while Necho did win some victories here against the Babylonians, he was unable to push back against them entirely. After installing a ruler in Judea to his liking and leaving behind a force to make sure they didn't pick the wrong king again, Necho returned to the newly unified Egypt. Necho wanted to be an emperor, like the great pharaohs of the New Kingdom hundreds of years before his birth, and he also wanted a modern Egypt capable of modern warfare and modern imperialism. He's believed to be the first pharaoh to have formally founded a navy, as opposed to earlier kings who built what could really only be called troop transports. This navy was crewed by Ionian Greeks, experienced sailors, and featured ships of war designed for sea combat. It's thought that the Ionians brought with them the knowledge needed to build and operate triremes, but evidence of this is somewhat lacking. One way or the other, though, Egypt was now an aspiring naval power. To augment this naval power, and for numerous economic benefits, Necho commissioned a canal which would join the Nile Delta ultimately to the Red Sea, and thus to the Arabian Peninsula, Mesopotamia, perhaps even India, though the Egyptians saw the ocean as just another desert and usually despised the idea of crossing it except via the safest, i.e. closest to the coast, possible route. It's likely that Necho never finished his canal. In fact, the Persian king Darius I created several monuments, claiming that he finished the project after inheriting Egypt as part of his own empire. Spoiler warning, I guess. Either way, 
Though the date of the canal's completion is debatable, it might have been close to a century after Necho ordered the digging to begin, and in lands no longer ruled by his descendants. Necho wouldn't live to see his ambitions of empire or of restoring Egypt's glory days realised, but his son Psamtik II and grandson Kybra continued the attempt. Things began to fall apart for the 26th dynasty when Kybra suffered a rebellion by one of his officers, who crowned himself Armos II, and Kybra was unable to take the dynasty back. Armos proved to be sufficiently troublesome to the Persians that his own son, Pasamtik III, was dealing with the threat of Persian conquest even during his coronation rites. A conquest which would in fact take place and determine Egypt's fate for centuries to follow. Arguably, these events are ultimately why modern day Egypt is predominantly Islamic rather than predominantly Christian, but that's speculation for another time. Either way, being eyed up by foreign powers is the price Necho knew that Egypt would pay by stepping onto the world stage. You can't hold mighty sway among nations without those nations taking note. You can't connect yourself to something without exposing yourself to it. All Necho had intended was that Egypt would be ready when the rest of the world came back for it. Sadly, if you're Necho at least, this was not to be. Thanks, Lucas. But now that we know a little bit more about what was going on around the reign of Necho II, I want to tweak history to give Egypt a better chance of restoring its glory days. And to do that, I don't want to change the outcome of a war or a battle. Instead, I want to talk a little bit more about the canal. Although much of Egypt's wealth came from its agricultural output, we do know they and the empires that would come to rule it traded with Africa and Asia, thanks to Egypt's connection with the Red Sea. In our timeline, ships originating from Red Sea ports would travel throughout East Africa, the trade for myrrh, frankincense, ivory, and turtle shells. The Red Sea ports also brought in peppers, spices, and silks from India. As you can imagine, much of this cargo would be taxed by local authorities. The revenue generated from this trade was immense, and our timeline was crucial in turning Rome into a powerful, long-lasting empire. However, once these ships returned to Egypt, the goods had to be transported overland to the major cities along the Nile. This added to their costs and also made the caravans transport them susceptible to raiders if the overland routes weren't properly guarded. But a canal connecting the Red Sea with the Nile River was significantly cut down on the time it would take to transport these goods and perhaps even allow Necho to move his Greek crew navy into the Red Sea and around Arabia to harass his Babylonian enemies. Surprise, motherfucker! Admittedly, the canal would be expensive, and there would be engineering challenges to overcome. If Herodotus can be believed, 120,000 people reportedly died trying to construct it, although that is likely an exaggeration. Still, we do know later attempts by the Arab rulers of Egypt to dig their own version of the canal reportedly lost 20,000 people, so the human cost could still be high. Additionally, the same floods that made the Nile a breadbasket would silt up the canal, meaning it would need to be regularly dug out in order for ships to use it. Also, while the Nile was at its lowest, the canal wouldn't be operational, which means goods could only traverse the canal at certain times of the year. This is further exacerbated by the fact that the times the canal is operational don't sync with the favorable winds necessary for training voyages to East Africa or India, meaning goods would need to sit in warehouses waiting for the canal to fill up again. Salt water from the Red Sea could also contaminate the Nile River, although building locks could resolve this, which is supposedly something Ptolemaic Egypt used for their version of this canal. That, of course, would mean ships traveling through the canal couldn't be larger than the lock, which could be a problem for large cargo haulers and warships. Still, these engineering problems I mentioned aren't insurmountable. The Grand Canal of China was built without modern construction methods and materials starting in the 6th century AD, but parts of the canal date back to even the 5th century BC. So Necho being able to finish his canal when Egypt was once again united, had a navy, and was trying to expand outward could have changed Egypt's outlook on the importance of maritime connections with the outside world. The wealth generated from increased trade with Asia and the rest of Africa could also fund the military necessary to defend Egypt from would-be invaders. Alas, that was not to be. The canal was likely abandoned before Necho's invasion of Syria ever began. Allegedly, an oracle told Necho it would be a bad idea, but then again, maybe it was just becoming too expensive to build and the resources were needed to fight the Babylonians. As was pointed out, some later conquerors of Egypt did attempt to connect the Nile River with the Red Sea, but it wasn't until the completion of the Suez Canal in 1869 that a canal permanently linked the Red Sea to the larger Mediterranean world. But what if Necho finished the canal? What if instead of finding the Babylonians, he laid the foundations for Egypt's continued independence? 
Well, an economically upgraded Egypt that had the Nile breadbasket, the increased trade that flowed through the Red Sea Canal, and a navy that could harass Middle Eastern conquerors could go a long way in making sure that Egypt was ruled by indigenous dynasties longer than in our timeline. Sure, much like with China's dynasties, some of them might not technically be Egyptian, but Egypt itself would maintain its independence longer than they did in our timeline. Admittedly, Egypt would need to protect these trade routes from pirates. In our timeline, an Arab tribe known as the Nabatians attacked Ptolemaic and Roman merchants when maritime trade through the Red Sea started to compete with the land routes to Asia. So, in order to protect the Red Sea trade routes, rather than focus on Syria, Egypt might have to send military expeditions into Arabia, and perhaps directly conquer those parts along the Red Sea. And speaking of expansion, would this Egypt build an empire along the coast of East Africa? I mean, where there is economic expansion, there is military expansion. And where there is military expansion, there is usually some form of political influence. And all too often, colonies. In fact, according to Herodotus, Neco sent out an expedition of Phoenician sailors to circumnavigate Africa 2,000 years before Vasco da Gama achieved that feat, which they allegedly accomplished after three years of sailing, with only a few stops to plant and harvest the food used to feed themselves on such a long trip. Now, to be fair, our only source for this expedition was Herodotus, who didn't give us a lot of details and also didn't believe the story himself. However, professional historians, websites like Bad Ancient, and history tubers like Andrew Rakich of Anton Shea Films do think the story has a high plausibility of being true. For one thing, Herodotus did say this. There they said that in sailing around Libya, they had the sun on their right hand. This is important, since the position of the sun is something a sailor would notice if they happened to sail around Africa. Also, while the Greeks at the time were great sailors, the Phoenicians may have been even better. For those who don't know, Phoenicians originated in what is today Lebanon, and due to a variety of reasons, developed a maritime culture that settled lands bordering the Mediterranean Sea. They founded the city of Carthage, the old rival of Rome, and we know a Carthaginian named Hanno the Navigator in the 5th century BC sailed past the Strait of Gibraltar, aka the Pillars of Hercules, likely reaching places as far south as modern day Gabon. Granted, ships of this era were slow, but if anyone was going to succeed in circumnavigating Africa in the 7th or 6th century BC, it was going to be them. In fact, the sailor Philip Beale built a replica Phoenician ship and sailed it around Africa between 2008 and 2010, which does make the Phoenician circumnavigation of Africa more believable. So, given what we know, it certainly seems plausible an Egyptian maritime empire might spring up because of Neko finishing his canal, and one interesting site for colonies could be Madagascar. In our timeline, Madagascar was settled by Austronesians around 500 BC, a century after Neko II's reign. But in this alternate timeline, the more maritime-oriented Egyptians might have stumbled on this island and settled it with Egyptians, Phoenicians, and or Greeks. Although, what this will mean when the Austronesians eventually migrate over there is anyone's guess. Maybe they will intermarry with these original colonists, eventually forming an entirely new culture, or be pushed into a different destination. Now, let's talk about what's happening outside of Egypt. With Egypt on a defensive in the Levant, perhaps using Judea as a buffer state, the future Persian Empire might not waste manpower and resources on Egypt. Although the Persian Empire did control Egypt for various periods, the satrapy of Egypt was not a model province and revolts did happen, which cost the Persians both money and men to put down. With a stronger Egypt, however, Persia may instead focus their time and treasury on the Greek city-states and might ultimately conquer them. Greeks may flee to Egypt, who would likely welcome them to serve in their navy, and Rome could be influenced more by the Persians instead of the Greeks. I don't want to play with you anymore. Speaking of Judea, if they do manage to survive thanks to Egyptian support, it's possible the Babylonian captivity would never happen. In our timeline, after the Babylonians captured Jerusalem and destroyed the temple there, many Judeans were deported to Babylon and were not allowed to return until decades later. This event had a major impact on the Jewish religion. That is difficult to read to summarize, but here we go. In an effort to survive without the central temple and the sacrifices made there, Jews developed the synagogue as places of worship and transformed the Torah into the basic text that governed the faith. But in the alternate timeline where Judea continues to exist as a client state of Egypt, the Babylonian exile wouldn't happen, the temple with its priesthood would continue on, and Judaism would basically just be a state religion of an Egyptian vassal, and any faiths drawing inspiration from it probably wouldn't look anything like our timeline's Christianity or Islam. Honestly, it's hard to guess what would happen next in this alternate history. We're talking about a change to history that happened thousands of years ago, and our understanding of that history is already kind of hazy to begin with. 
there are just so many questions remaining. Like, would someone eventually get the bright idea to build a canal centuries earlier through the Suez to directly connect the Red Sea with the Mediterranean? Would someone, annoyed with Egypt's monopoly on trade with Asia and East Africa, decide to get access to it by going the long way across the Atlantic Ocean? It seems plausible that someone would, but exactly who or when is pure guesswork left to authors who are better storytellers than I am. What we do know is that for a brief period of time, the Egyptian pharaohs and the culture they ruled over had the opportunity to reverse their fortunes and ensure their millennia old civilization continued on for thousands of years more. Unfortunately for the Egyptians, that didn't happen. But let's just hope no one is making that same mistake again. Well, that is all I have to say on the subject. If you enjoy what I do, please like, comment, subscribe, share this video, support me on Patreon, or check out my buddy Lucas at Armchair Egyptology. I'm Matt Mitrovich, the alternate historian. Bye.